All right, good morning. My name is Moses, and I'm the church planning pastor of Rosebrook. Thank you for joining us for service today. Uh, for those of us, uh, or those of you joining on Zoom, uh, we miss you and are uh, looking forward to seeing you again next week. So uh, if this is your first time here, you are joining us in the middle of a sermon series uh, through the book of Judges. And today we are on part two of the life of Samson, the last and final judge. And we're going to wrap up this series at the end of um, later this month. Uh, next week, we'll take a brief hiatus with a guest speaker speaking for us during our anniversary service. And then we'll wrap it up at the end of the month. And then we'll have a few weeks of uh, our annual uh, Faith and Work series. And afterwards, we'll go through the book of Second Peter. And then next year, we'll be starting a new series on redeeming piety. What does it look like to... Um, pray, read your Bible, do all the, uh, the, the, I guess, traditional Christian things that we typically use to measure spiritual growth, that the Bible doesn't necessarily equate on a one-to-one -one basis, meaning just because you do more prayer or reading doesn't necessarily mean you grow. But nevertheless, what does it look like to do it in a manner that is healthy, that can contribute, contribute to our growth? And so that will be our, like, kind of our, what you can look forward to going into early next year. Now, uh, last week we learned the first part about Samson's backstory where he was miraculously conceived, anointed by God to save his people, uh, pointing us to a day when the greater Samson, the Lord Jesus himself, would be miraculously born to save God's people with divine power once and for all. And so as we learned before, the book of Judges shows us the generational spiritual decay of God's people as they become increasingly married to the idolatrous culture of their neighbors. And so if Samson is the last judge in the book of Judges, then the Israelites are at their spiritual lowest. And you would think then that God would send the best, most wonderful judge to conclude this story, this book. But we actually see the complete opposite. Samson ends up being the most flawed of all the judges, the most violent, the most sexually addicted, the most emotionally immature and entitled. And so this morning, we're going to see what kind of young adult he's grown up into as he considers marriage at a time when God's people have culturally assimilated with their idolatrous neighbors, specifically the Philistines. But before I go on, I want to make sure that um, you all understand that I'm not here to call anyone out. Okay, I'm not here to call anyone out as we get into this uh, topic about uh, cultural assimilation, about being unequally yoked, all these things. If anything, my hope is that we'll, we'll see that all of us have to some degree assimilated to the values of our secular or idolatrous neighboring cultures, whether in making decisions about life partners, career choices, or even where we choose to call our church home. But as we'll see, just because we made a wrong or unwise decision doesn't mean that God can't still redeem our situations either. All right? So let's just be really clear about this, that we're not here to call anyone out specifically. Now, I have three points for today's message. First is death through being unequally yoked. The second point is death through cultural accommodation. And third point is Death and life through God's mercy. So first point, death through being unequally yoked from Judges chapter 14, starting from verse 1. One day when Samson was in Timnah, one of the Philistine women caught his eye. And when he returned home, he told his father and mother, a young Philistine woman in Timnah caught my eye and I want to marry her. Get her for me. And his father and mother objected. Isn't there... Even one woman in our tribe or among all, of his, among all the Israelites that you could marry, they asked. Why must you go to the pagan Philistines to find a wife? But Samson told his father, get her for me. She looks good to me. Now, I, I don't know about you all, but one of my greatest um, dating mistakes that I made uh, before I got married was not involving my parents. I never talk to them about my about the people I was interested in. I never invited them to pray for me or us. 
I just went and did it. And then they'd find out somehow, usually through my sister, that I was dating someone. Interestingly enough, it wasn't until my mid-20s when I involved my parents and asked them for prayer and their blessing to pursue Rachel that I ended up actually marrying the woman of my dreams. And so you can be sure then that as my sons get older, that I will tell them this story enough times that this will, it'll be seared into their conscience because I don't want them to make the same mistakes that I did when I was young, emotionally immature, and impulsive. Samson's approach to marriage demonstrates peak emotional immaturity and impulsiveness. He barely interacts with this woman, and what he does know is that she is physically attractive and she is a Philistine. He doesn't ask his parents for prayer, for their wisdom, or their blessing. He straight up tells them, get her for me. I don't care what it costs. I don't care what your opinions about her are or about her faith background, etc. I'm attracted to her, and you will do as you're told. Now, if my boys ever spoke to me or my wife like that, it will not go well in our house. Now, as any God-fearing parents would do, the first thing they push back to Samson about is her faith. The issue is here isn't her eth race or ethnicity. Let's make that absolutely clear. It's not because she's a Philistine per se. Remember, many Canaanites repented and joined the Israelites and married into the Israelite family with no issues. The issue that her par his parents are bringing up is that she worships the gods of the Philistines. But Samson refuses to listen because he's not teachable. And he tells his father, get her for me. She looks good to me. I mean, in other words, it's like, you better go and fetch her because I think she's hot. Again, who talks to their father like this? And we'll learn later why he feels entitled and enabled to do this. But for now, this is how he speaks to his parents. And obviously, I mean, why is this such a big issue? I mean, number one, isn't it, very, isn't it better to marry non-Christians so that we can bring them to church and share the gospel with them? I mean, in one sense, the Apostle Paul does acknowledge that if you're already married to a non-Christian, you should stay married and let your godliness win them over in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. So stay married, he says. Don't break up over this. Like, be good to them. Be good to your spouse if they're not a Christian. So don't be ashamed if this is your situation. This is an invitation, actually, for our church to love and serve your family and to come alongside you to win them over to Christ. But there is a bigger issue of being unequally yoked that I want to explore here. For those of us who didn't grow up on a dairy farm, which is pretty much all of us here, to be unequally yoked means to have oxen of two different sizes, usually one big, one small, linked together by the neck and shoulders, usually dragging a plow through the field in order to plant seeds. And in such an unequally yoked situation, yoke, so yoke is the thing that goes over the neck and shoulders, the, to be unequally yoked, what it usually happens then is, which ox do you think does most of the work? The bigger ox or the smaller ox? The bigger ox, right? So the bigger ox ends up doing most of the work and tires out quicker than he or she, or he, I guess, ought to, while the smaller ox usually is younger and untrained tries to go off course and do whatever he wants, and the older one usually has to be the one to stabilize him and to keep him on track. The Bible uses this imagery to show what happens to believers when we're bound to non-Christians too intimately. As the bigger ox, we as believers will tire out quicker as we try to stay on the narrow path because the smaller ox will try to take us off course. The result is that our faith and loyalty to Christ could potentially weaken or diminish. And I've seen this play out so, so many times with couples. It's hard. And oftentimes, it plays out this way because churches maybe are guilty of shaming and judging them. Or maybe sometimes.
times, no matter what they do, they just tire out because of the competing values and conversations that are happening at home. Whatever the case, I hope that in our church, if there are those of you who are in unequally yoked relationships, that as a church that we can help win them over to Christ, as the Apostle Paul would say to do. I hope that you don't feel ashamed or judged here because we want to come alongside you as well in winning them over. Nevertheless, someone might say then, well, my partner completely respects my faith and encourages me to go to church even if he or she doesn't want to go, so this won't be an issue for us. Well, that's nice, but this imagery is more getting at the issue of idolatry, especially those subtle, unacknowledged ones that all of us wrestle with. So if we're in an intimate relationship, whether that be a life partner or even a business partner, where God's kingdom isn't the central purpose for everything that we do, then we'll have to be extra vigilant to guard our faith in Jesus to make sure that our faith doesn't diminish. There will be constant pressure to worship something else other than Jesus, whether that be our spouse, our kids, quarterly prophets, our careers, and so on. Now, this isn't to say then that we shouldn't conduct business with non-Christians. That's not what I'm saying at all. But it does mean that we should also be mindful of sometimes our employer's core values and how it might conflict with our pursuit of the common good of our neighbors. Because when we are in those spaces and we are too intimately wrapped up in a vision for a life that conflicts with maybe some basic Christian values that could hinder, diminish our faith if we are not careful. Again, likewise, this is why the Bible cautions believers against unknowingly marrying non-Christians. Because when we are unequally yoked and do not have a community of believers to lean on for strength and rest, after wrestling against idolatry and idolatrous values, our faith in Jesus may die into irrelevant oblivion. There may come a point where we just say, oh, going to church is too hard, or it causes too much drama in our house, or I don't want to be the only one going all the time because I'm ashamed. Be watchful. And lean on your church community for strength. Second point, death through cultural accommodation. Verse 4, Samson's father and mother didn't realize that the Lord was at work in this, meaning in this, in Samson's sinful desire to marry this woman, uh, which was creating an opportunity to work against the Philistines who ruled over Israel at the time. Now, in many ways, Samson is a product also of his culture and background. As much as he's at fault for his actions, the broader Israelite culture has decayed more than it ever has. Whereas Othniel, if you remember the first judge that we learned about, fought Israel's enemies and married a godly Israelite woman in return. Samson, the last judge, goes among Israelites' enemies and marries an idolatrous neighbor. Notice that even the, as the Philistines rule now over the Israelites, the Israelites never cry out for liberation from their oppression. They never cry out in repentance for their idolatry. For the very first time, they're actually okay with assimilating and becoming like their idolatrous neighbors. If you've been following with us through this book of Judges, this has never happened before. They eventually came to a point where they cried out to the Lord for help. So what's going on here? Who are these new oppressors? The Philistines were, a, were relatively new colonizers from the West that had settled into the southern coastal portions of modern-day Palestine. They were of Greek origin. They're often associated with military might in the Bible and other, uh, other texts from that era because they had a monopoly on iron-based weaponry in the region while everyone around them in the east were still using bronze-based weapons. And because of their military might and violent conquistador-like antics, it's easy to see why the local Semitic people might be drawn to them. 
All right, now notice what I'm getting at here. Along with Samson, God's people, who are a people from the East, are enslaved by idolatrous Western colonizers. And they're essentially unaware or indifferent to their enslavement. And because of their cultural accommodation, the Israelites not only care, not only not care that they're colonized, they might even see it as an opportunity to move up by marrying their greedy, violent, idolatrous colonizers. In short, the Israelite faith and culture was on track toward extinction within a few generations. And God was not, a lot, was not going to let that happen. And yet, catch what I'm saying here. Before you had Uncle Tom's and model minorities, you had Samson. Again, the issue isn't marrying Philistines. The issue is not marrying Westerners. The issue is getting unequally yoked with unrepentant idol worshipers. And as we see this cultural accommodation playing out in the rest of Judges 14 and 15, Samson adopts the values of the Philistines. He's a vindictive, violent leader. He becomes like the Philistines and it eventually backfires on him. His marriage is sabotaged by the Philistines and he ends up killing a bunch of them in retribution. Then the Philistines are in our retribution come back with more men in Judges 15.10 and they look to, for Samson to kill him. God's people are, are the worst at trying to act like the world because we are not of this world. God's people are the worst at trying to act like the world because we are not of this world. Even as Samson tries to, be, tries to act like the Philistines, he's a worse Philistine than the Philistines themselves. Judges 15 verse 10. Then the men of Judah asked the Philistines, Why are you attacking us? What do we do? And the Philistines replied, We've come to capture Samson. We've come to pay him back for what he did to us. Remember, which Samson did in response to what the Philistines did to his wife or his uh, fiance, which was in response to what they did to Samson. So it's just like this unending cycle of Samson just behaving just like the Philistines. So 3,000 men of Judah went down to get Samson at the cave in the rock of Edom or Edom. 3,000 men to capture one man. That means they know that Samson is immensely powerful. And this is why he speaks the way he does even to his own father in a very entitled, disrespectful way. They come to him and they said to Samson, don't you realize the Philistines rule over us? Don't you realize they're our colonizers? What are you doing to us? But Samson replied, I only did to them what they did to me. But the men of Judah told him, we have come to tie you up and hand you over to the Philistines. All right, Samson says, I'll play that game. But promise me that you won't kill me yourselves. Notice how, the, notice how the Israelites don't celebrate Samson's victory over the Philistines right before this passage. Or notice how then they don't rally around Samson, who they know is immensely powerful, so, like, with superhuman strength. Instead, when their Philistine rulers fight back or try to punish them, the Israelites blame Samson for not knowing his place in their colonized society. This is peak existential enslavement and cultural accommodation. They're blaming their liberators for their oppressor's retribution. They are blaming Samson, who is their liberator, for their oppressor's retribution. That is peak enslavement. That is peak colonized thought, where you are so colonized, so culturally accommodated that to disturb the order that is actually oppressing you is a threat to you. Now, I'm always encouraged when other traditional Reformed Presbyterian pastors and scholars observe these similar cultural tensions in the Bible with our, our, our cultural situation today. 
I really am because it makes me feel not so crazy. Because I see, read this and I'm like, there is so much cultural relevance here with what's going on today in our world. Am I the only one that sees this? And no, I'm not. Praise God. Tim Keller makes this observation about this passage when he says, those churches which we can, for the sake of convenience, call, quote, liberal, appeal to a section of modern culture which has at least three idols. Number one, personal choice and freedom. Number two, absolute tolerance and the rejection of exclusive truth and pers personal responsibility. And number three, professional expertise and status. People who feel like because they have the degrees or the power socially that they know better than everyone else and they don't know how to stay in their lanes. They accept modern sex ethics. They do not do church discipline. They do not preach Christ as the only way to salvation. Their ministry is supportive and therapeutic and no one is ever warned of God's judgment. But, Keller says, you can be colonized the other way as well. More, quote, conservative churches appeal to those who idolize, number one, an idealized past. Number two, the nuclear family. Number three, one's own race and traditional culture. And four, authority. While liberal culture is relativistic, conservative culture is moralistic and makes an idol out of, quote, goodness and respectability. They tend to put so much emphasis on family life that singles and single parents feel like second-class citizens. If churches preached about racism, the need for justice for the poor, there will be conflict within their communities. If you've been in Roseburg long enough, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Whether you're colonized by the, uh, by the Western left or the right, just like in Samson's Israel, what makes God's people culturally distinct gets watered down when we accommodate to those who wield cultural power and we are in danger of becoming spiritually distinct. Uh, extinct. Whether you're colonized by the Western left or the right, just like in Samson's Israel, what makes God's people culturally distinct gets watered down when we accommodate to those in cultural power and we are in danger of becoming spiritually extinct. Third and final point death and life through God's mercy. Verse 14 of chapter 15. As Samson arrived at Lehi, the Philistines came shouting in triumph. But the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon Samson, and he snapped the ropes on his arms as if they were burnt strands of flax, and they fell from his wrists. Then he found the jawbone of a recently killed donkey, and he picked it up and killed 1,000 Philistines with it because he didn't have a sword. Then Samson said, with the jawbone of a donkey, I've piled them in heaps with a, uh, with a jawbone of a donkey. I've killed a thousand men. When he finished his boasting, he threw away the jawbone and the place was, called, uh, was named Jawbone Hill. Samson was now very thirsty, obviously after killing a thousand men. And he threw away the jawbone. Uh, I'm sorry. And, uh, and he cried out to the Lord, you have accomplished this great victory by the strength of your servant, which isn't technically true, it was the strength of God. But must I now die of thirst and fall into the hands of these pagans? What a spoiled brat. So God caused water to gush out of, a hollow, out of a hollow in the ground at Lehi, and Samson was revived as he drank. Then he named the place the spring of the one who cried out, and it is still in Lehi to this day. Samson judged Israel for 20 years during the period when the Philistines dominated the land. If there's anything then we can take away from this part of Samson's story and life, it's that no one comes out clean. There is no villain or victim here because everyone is at fault. Everyone is complicit. Samson is careless, violent, and doesn't honor God's divine appointment in his life. He acts like a very uh, entitled, spoiled brat. The Philistines act like a bunch of thugs and slaughter their own countrymen. In many ways, Samson has become just like his colonizers and the culture around him. Yet, it's easy to read the story and judge Samson and the Israelites for their faults. But I want to ask us, how have we become like Samson in embracing the cultural values of our idolatrous neighbors? Let me get more specific. You know, it's interesting. When you look at the historical decline of membership in both liberal and conservative churches, do you know 
who are the people that are leaving are, like what age group? Generally, it's the younger people, right? You can go to a very traditional, uh, the more extreme you go on the left or the right church on Sunday, and generally, they are older. What's going on there? Where are the adult conversions and the baptisms and the churches that we worship at? Where have we come to embrace the cultural values of our idolatrous neighbors, even within our churches? And how might God rectify this? You know, so many times we blame young people for leaving our churches to the young people because we think and we we vilify them as saying that they embrace the world, hence they do not want to come to our churches anymore. Sure, that might be the case for some, but the older I get, the more mistakes I see people in my generation making mistakes, the more I, be I begin to wonder if rather the question should be, where have we as older members of God's church of, of churches embraced the world's idolatrous values so that the young people who actually did want to follow Christ no longer want to come to our churches because they see how we've compromised and accommodated to either the left or the right. I think before we begin to point the finger at others, we should point 10 fingers at ourselves. Before we see the speck in someone else's eye, let's take that big giant log out of our own eyes. The ironic part of Samson's story is that God uses Samson's very own weakness, his sexual appetite, his anger, his imperfect prayers, and ultimately his strength to redeem Samson and his people. Samson unwillingly becomes a catalyst for more conflict. Because Samson is so broken as a judge, so weak as a judge, spiritually weak as a judge, the Philistines end up hating the Israelites that much more, even as they rule over the Israelites, resulting in greater division between the two faiths and the two nations, a division and separation that God's people were actually desperately in need of. In other words, it's God's mercy for him to use his people's weakness to make sure there isn't cultural accommodation between them and their idolatrous neighbors. It's actually God's mercy for him not to allow the unbelieving world to not like the church for too long because it drives a wedge between us and reminds everyone that we are not of this world. The redemptive plans of God cannot be thwarted even by our own sinfulness and weakness. In fact, he uses our very sinfulness and weakness to bring about our repentance and redemption. So if you are discouraged by what's going on in, the broader, in our broader society with politics, with all the rhetoric about Christian, uh, how Christianity is married to the left or the right or to different ideologies, in one sense, we can be reassured that this cultural accommodation is actually playing out in a way that is going to drive a wedge in the church from the rest of the world. Let the world see how bad we are at being like them. And let them hate us. And let the persecution come. Because when it does, the true follower of Christ will come out of that fire more purified, more, gold, more purified like gold. And we will be more equipped, more encouraged to do actual kingdom work and to actually be a witness to our neighbors. Don't be discouraged by how things are playing out right now because it's not the end of the story. God will use messed up leaders and their weakness, sometimes in a way that's not redemptive, at least even in our lifetime. But it will play out in a manner in which God will get his glory and the church will rise from the ashes. And so if it's not clear already, God then uses broken and flawed people like Samson for his redemptive purposes, not because God's cruel, but because he's merciful. He doesn't use people that are good and put together and have perfect theology 
because he's reminding us that he's all powerful and we're not. He is not limited to using only good and obedient servants. In his wisdom and mercy, God chooses to use those who are weak to remind us that even uh, even as salvation is by grace, so is our sanctification. And I want to make that plug for this year's D group through our missional communities. We are going to go through my favorite, one of my favorite all-time Christian books, this book, which I've read three times already, and I will probably read for a fourth time this year. Um, Probably the only Christian book outside the Bible that I've been so obsessed with in this way. And I think it's helpful for us to be reminded that sanctification is also by God's grace, just as salvation is. Too often we understand and think about a Christian life as if the gospel is only the ABCs of the Christian life, where we're saved by grace, and then the rest of it, we have to just try really hard. But that's not necessarily the case either. We need God's grace to help us to get through the D, to get through D to Z. And this book is really helpful for that. I hope it's an encouragement to all of us as you sign up for Mission of Communities. So again, in his wisdom, God uses those who are weak to remind us that even as salvation is by his grace, so is our sanctification. He doesn't wait to use us in response to our good behavior, but he even uses us in our sinfulness and brokenness. Just like Samson's bad behavior then resulted in greater separation between God's people and the Philistines, he may use our sins to sanctify us and our people. Not even our sin can, sa- can stop God from doing good in our midst. And so when we see Samson, we must see ourselves at our worst when we're given too much power to change our societies. When we crave power to change our lives and our communities and wield this power in the ways that we think is right, we must remember that we are headed toward the path of Samson. Instead, we must remember that true power to change our neighbors and community lies in the power of the gospel and in the power of our Savior. When we rely upon our strength and wisdom, even when it's an answer to prayer, we don't honor Christ. God can still use it, but it doesn't excuse our bad behavior. Instead, we must remember that true power from God lies in sharing the gospel in both word and deed. Again, true power lies in sharing the gospel in both word and deed. We, in other words, just as Jesus died for our sins and weakness, we too must serve our neighbors in weakness, for in our weakness we discover Christ's true divine strength in us. Just as Jesus preached the gospel boldly and offended many, we too must embrace the call to preach and share the gospel even if it offends our listeners so that we know what it's like for Christ to have suffered for our sake so that we end up loving him and appreciating him that much more. And just as Jesus showed great compassion to the poor and the marginalized, we too must show great compassion and poor to the poor and the marginalized in our midst if we are to truly say that we are spiritually growing. Too often we measure our growth on how much we know and how much we do spiritual things. But the Bible does not use those for categories of growth. That is not reformed. That is not Calvinist. Calvin himself says, for those preachers who only preach to the soul and neglect all of the needs of the body, he says such people are asses. Literally, those are his words. If you neglect the body and at the expense of the soul, that is not the complete gospel. So friends, when you measure what it means to grow, stop thinking about it in terms of what you know. Instead, it's how much you love the Lord and how much you love your neighbor as yourself. You know, it's funny. um, As a staff, we actually sent out a little mini survey to some of the folks that um, we felt like were just very encouraging to us. We're 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 serving a lot and we seemed like they were growing. And we sent a survey to them anonymously and asked them to fill it out. And surely enough, they all said, when we asked them, are you growing uh, at Rosebrook? They all said, yes. When we asked them, why? What are you doing at church? What is contributing to your growth? They all said, I serve. I show up. When it's inconvenient to show up for the poor, I try to be there. 
And sure, I read my Bible and pray, absolutely. But when I do that in conjunction with serving and loving sacrificially, I feel like I am growing that much more. So many times we complain in our churches that we are not growing. Well, let me ask you, when was the last time you showed up to serve? When was the last time you went out of way to love your neighbor as yourself? So much of the time we think, oh, if I just love the Lord more by praying more and by reading the Bible more, then I'm okay. What about the other commandment? The second greatest one, which people, with some scholars say is actually uh, two, like two sides of the same coin, that you can't have one without the other. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you're not doing that, you're not growing. You need both. If you're not doing both, of course you're not growing. Too often times, though, when we're doing just the first one, or praying and reading our Bible, we deceive ourselves into th- thinking that we're growing when we're not. The Lord has a lot to say about that on Judgment Day. What is, a true exor- what is the exercise of true divine power? It's to love our neighbors and sharing the gospel in both word and deed and suffering like Christ, and loving our neighbors in our weakness, even at at a tremendous cost to us. So may that be our prayer, and may God answer our prayers. Now, for those of you who have served as drivers for the groceries uh, in the past, let's say, eight months, can you please stand up? Say standing up, please. We're not going to applaud. We're not going to applaud. Just stand up, please. Because I want you all to pray for our church right now. Because I feel like what you do as a church is so hidden and unacknowledged, which is great. That's what we want. But I have never heard from you all that you feel like you're not growing. In fact, I've heard the complete opposite. And I want others to be able to ask you about that. To want to walk alongside you, to learn from you about that. And we want your prayers for our church to help us to recognize that true growth comes in both sharing the gospel in both word and deed. All right. So we're going to close in prayer. And you all who are standing around, can you just pray for our church too as I pray out loud for our church? Because I really do think that. There's so much we can learn from you, and there are so many ways that you can bless us. Let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just pray for our church right now. And as we think about what it means to not to die into irrelevant irre- oblivion as a church, and when we think about what it means to, for you to revive our churches to grow and to be a blessing to our neighbors. For so many times, we, are gu- we have been guilty and still are guilty of accommodating to our culture, to our culture's values of whether it's profits, whether it's glory, whether it's materialism, whether it's sexual or relational like pleasure, whatever it might be, Lord. We need your help. We need you to lead us to repentance. And we need instead your spirit to give us the courage to share the gospel, even at great great cost to us and our reputations. And we need you to give us the courage to love our neighbors with our own deeds, even at great cost to us. And Lord, help us to never be content that we are growing or that spiritual growth is determined by simply doing spiritual things. If that's the case, I pray that you may open our eyes and help us to see the hypocrisy of our faith. That you, yourself, did not love us, redeem us and forgive us by just doing spiritual things, but you did the ultimate bodily thing by dying for us. So help us, Lord, to also then embrace the path of Christ by sharing the gospel in our words, but also loving our neighbors with our bodies at great cost to us so that they may see and believe 
with sacrificial love of our Savior. Thank you, Jesus, and we pray.